Shenandoah Valley Civil War Museum, located in the Frederick County 1840 Courthouse. The Courthouse and the City of Winchester witnessed much activity during the Civil War, and the graffiti on our walls testifies to some of that history. I'm going to be talking today about six Union officers who were captured and brought to the Courthouse. I am standing on the second floor at one of the museum's most interesting pieces of graffiti, the Gettysburg officers. These six men were captured after the Battle of Gettysburg. How did they get here to Winchester? What happened to them after they left Winchester? These are some of the questions I will answer today. The writing is very faint and only a few words are easily read. Here we have darkened the words so you can see them. In addition to these six names, there are six more names on the list that we won't talk about today. Notice that the names are in order by rank. Reading each line, you see the rank, then the individual's name, his unit number and name, and the place and date of capture. We found having the unit, the place and date of capture was invaluable in identifying the soldier. In some cases, such as this example, even the first letter of the last name was hard to decipher. Here the N in Norcross looked more like an M, which made it an unusual name. Fortunately, 2nd Massachusetts was easier to read and that helped identify him. Through our research, we found that these six men were captured after Gettysburg when Meade's forces, mostly cavalry, were chasing Lee as the Confederate forces were heading south. All but one of the six were captured north of the Potomac, with one, Norcross, captured July 12 in Ashby Gap. Most Gettysburg Union prisoners were immediately marched to Stanton and then marched or sent by rail to Richmond. We think this group was kept in the courthouse here in Winchester because they were sick or wounded. The first name on the list is Major Pope, who was captured at Funkstown, Maryland, as he lay sick in a house that was behind enemy lines. It appears that he fell ill on the way to Gettysburg. Here is one of Pope's records, which gives the date of his capture and exchange, present December and January 1863. November 1863 to March 1864, absent, prisoner of war. Then further down, prisoner declared exchange. Pope is one of the two of this group who was exchanged while they were in Richmond's Libby prison. He was exchanged on May 12, 1864. He took command of the 8th New York for the second time in 1864. Next on the list is Charles Farnsworth. While commanding the 1st Connecticut near Halltown, West Virginia, Farnsworth led a charge that overran the picket line of the 13th Virginia Cavalry. He was surrounded by the enemy and shot off his horse. Here is another graffiti image from the second floor of the courthouse. We choose to believe that this is Major Farnsworth. Notice the leg in the air behind the horse. Broken plaster obscures the rest of the image and we have enhanced this photograph as well. After Farnsworth was shot off his horse, he fought hand to hand with his saber. He was seriously wounded in the battle. Farnsworth and 24 of his men were unable to escape and were captured. Farnsworth was also exchanged. The men with the two highest ranks on the courthouse list were the ones who were exchanged. He was exchanged March 14, 1864, and due to poor health, resigned from the Army. Captain Robert Schofield was in Hagerstown with the 1st Vermont Cavalry, July 11 through July 13. On July 13, the unit encountered a strong enemy picket. Captain Scoville led the charge against rebel forces, was wounded and taken prisoner. Scoville remained a prisoner until the end of the war. Norcross, 
who was mentioned earlier, was part of the California 100, a group of Californians who wanted to fight in the East. However, California troops were allowed only to enlist as a unit assigned to the California Home Guard. This ad solicits men to go fight in the East. The governor of Massachusetts accepted the 100 men as a separate company in the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry. As the men were sailing from California around Cape Horn in December 1862 en route to the East Coast, the excitement in Boston was on the rise. One Boston newspaper article reported that the Californians were such good horsemen that their horses climbed trees. Norcross of the California 100 was captured south of Winchester on July 12th, as this uh, report from his cavalry commander uh, shows. The last two men on the list are Edward Potter and James Kellogg. Both of them were in the 6th Michigan Cavalry. You may recognize the 6th as Custer's regiment. We have no image of Potter. He and Kellogg were captured at Falling Waters, also known as the Battle of Williamsport or Hagerstown. At Falling Waters, two Federal cavalry companies attacked the Confederate rear guard that was protecting the Potomac where Lee's forces were crossing and heading south. Captain James Kidd, also of the 6th Michigan Cavalry, who came upon the scene in time to observe the charge of the two companies, described the action in his diary. The little band of less than a hundred men charged right into the midst of ten times their number of veteran troops. The first onset surprised and astonished the enemy, who had mistaken Weber's force for a squadron of their own cavalry, the audacity of the thing dazed them for a minute, and for a minute only. The Union forces were able to pierce the first line, but there could be but one result. Recovering from their surprise, the Confederate infantry rallied and, seizing their arms, made short work of their daring assailants. The two brave troops were more than decimated. Kidd's account from his diary is different from that of the official records that describes a cavalry charge as the most gallant ever made. Kellogg was shot in the side and Potter in the finger. After the southern forces brought their captives across the Potomac, Potter's finger was amputated at the first joint. Throughout his captivity he suffered with gangrene and lost more of his finger. We have no recollections from these five officers when they crossed to the south over the Potomac River into Confederate territory. They may have shared the feelings of captured soldier Captain Bernard Domchek. When we look back across the Potomac that separated us again from the land of the free, our eyes caressed longingly the Maryland mountains where our army must be. Reverie ended. We stopped wool gathering at the savage command March. Meanwhile, here in Winchester around July 3rd and 4th, the town was in Confederate hands and things were fairly quiet. This timeline places Winchester in the context of events. Captured material began arriving in the last week of June. They hear word of the battle on July 5. On Monday night, July 6, Major Bridgeforth the Provost Marshal of Winchester informed the citizens of the magnitude of what was coming. He had received a dispatch stating that 5,000 sick and wounded were on their way to Winchester. In fact, there were more than 8,500, almost double the population of the town. To cope with such an onslaught, every building in Winchester, public and private, housed the sick and wounded in a very organized system. The captured Gettysburg officers probably arrived in Winchester from July 12 through July 16 or 17. We estimate the officers were kept in the Winchester courthouse from seven to 10 days. Farnsworth in his diary details a march of the nine officers and 300 enlisted captives from the courthouse in Winchester to Middletown on July 22nd. 
then Front Royal on July 23rd, Sperryville, July 24th, Culpeper, July 25th. They left Gordonsville the next day and reached Richmond that night, July 26th. The officers went to Libby Prison in Richmond. Libby Prison was an old tobacco warehouse. At Libby, the prisoners, mostly officers, were crowded so tightly that there was barely room for each man to sleep on the floor. There were severe food shortages, particularly after Sanitary Commission boxes of food and clothing were no longer allowed to be delivered. Windows were barred but open, leaving inmates freezing in the winter and insufferably hot in the Richmond summer. Every prison had its dead zone, and Libby's was the windows. Prisoners caught at the windows were shot. In February 1864, 109 prisoners escaped by tunnel, with 59 eventually reaching Union lines. None of the officers on this list were in that group of escapees. Since the prison history of 2nd Lieutenant James Kellogg of the 6th Michigan is well documented in his military and pension records, we focus on his experience from Libby Prison and onward. This is his prisoner of war record that was compiled by the War Office. It shows that while he was at Libby, Kellogg was in and out of the hospital suffering with dysentery and diarrhea. First Lieutenant Mark Bassett of the 53rd Illinois Infantry recalled that he knew Kellogg from their time at Libby Prison and later at Camp Sorghum in Columbia, South Carolina. He thought that Kellogg was the last man he would have expected to live through prison. This is taken from Kellogg's pension application. This record also shows the date that Kellogg and probably others of the courthouse group were transferred in May 1864 from Richmond to Danville, Virginia, and then to Macon, Georgia. In an 1896 newspaper article, Captain George Hill of the 7th Michigan Cavalry describes the train ride from Danville to Macon. There was scarcely standing room in that car, and the cramped quarters caused us much discomfort. Two guards at each door kept a keen eye upon us lest we should escape. Lieutenant Kellogg of a Michigan regiment concealed himself in a water tower and was not noticed when the train moved on. His liberty was of short duration, however, for he was recaptured and we found him at Camp Oglethorpe, Macon, when we arrived. The prisoner's final stop was Camp Sorghum in Columbia, South Carolina. The camp got its name because sorghum molasses was one of the main foods fed to prisoners. There are several diaries written after the war by Union officers who were prisoners there. The prison began as an empty field with guards placed in a circle around it. Prisoners gradually made crude dwellings. There were approximately 1,500 prisoners, all officers, held in Camp Sorghum. And by December 1864, there were 373 successful escapes from the Oakman Field Camp. That's 373 out of 1,500 prisoners. Of course, there were also many unsuccessful attempts. Because escapes were so common, prisoners were moved to the local home for the insane, hence the camp's new name, Camp Asylum. General Sherman and Union forces were nearing Columbia, so Kellogg and other Camp Asylum prisoners were moved February 15, 1865, by train to Charlotte, North Carolina. On February 16, Kellogg and seven other prisoners bribed guards at the train and ran for freedom. Three men were recaptured, but the remaining four officers traveled 350 miles in 28 days and arrived in Knoxville, Tennessee on March 14. The escape is recounted in Kellogg's 1891 obituary. The obituary stated that he loved to tell the story of his escape, and I quote from the obituary. The terrible journey, the pursuit of the rebels and their close proximity at times, the faithful Negroes and Southern Unionists, the lonely camping grounds and scanty fare. Kellogg's claim for a pension increase, shown in part here, 
also provides details of the escape. First Lieutenant Potter, Company C, 6th Michigan Cavalry, was captured at the same time with applicant, and said Potter and James E. Love, Captain 8th Kansas Infantry, also Charles Adams and Eben Grant, Captains 1st Vermont Cavalry, were of the party who escaped in the night of February 16, 1865. Lieutenant Norcross, also listed in the same graffiti, was also part of the group that escaped in Charlotte. Kellogg, however, did not mention Norcross in his pension application. But Eureka! We now had more names to research to see if we could locate diaries and find out more of this story. We were able to identify the newly named escapees and also discovered Captain James Love's reminiscences that had a very detailed account of the trip from Charlotte to Tennessee. Love states that Potter was part of the original escape group but became separated. Potter must have been recaptured because Potter's service record shows that he was turned over to the Union Army when Sherman's men reached Columbia in March 1865. Captain Love did say that Norcross was one of the men who made it to freedom. So of these six names on the courthouse wall, we can identify three that escaped and two of the three that made it to Tennessee. Remember that the two highest ranking men had been exchanged. The officers knew how much worse conditions in the prison camps were for enlisted men, Farnsworth, who was paroled early in 1864, provided testimony for a sanitary commission hearing in July of 64. He stated that he visited Belle Isle in Richmond, the enlisted prison on an island in the James River. Quote, fed on corn and water, scantily clothed with but a few blankets, our patriotic soldiers have suffered the severest misfortunes of the war. Here, by the hundreds, they offered up their lives in their country's cause. Victims of disease, starvation, and exposure. Sufferings a thousand times more dreadful than the wounds of the battlefield. As many as 14 have been known to freeze in a single night. James Love also commented on enlisted prisoners in a January 1865 letter to his wife, and I quote, the thousands of privates who suffer and die from hunger and exposures and torments unnameable and inconceivable. Poor fellows, they die unhonored and unsung martyrs to a deadly policy. He meant the end of prisoner exchange. Better, far better, had they died a lingering death from wounds or fever on the field. Our sufferings are pleasures in comparison. Our prisons are sumptuous and comfortable to describe. The average death rate for prisons overall was 13.7%. There were some really bad camps and everyone knows about them. They know about Andersonville. The death rate of Union prisoners at Andersonville was almost 29%. But in New York, Elmira Prison, a Union prison, had a death rate of almost 25%. These prisoners of war could not know, at least initially, if their loved ones knew that they had been captured or even if they were still alive. These men did know that there was a good chance that they would die in battle or in prison and that no one would know their fate. When I see their names on the courthouse wall, I can hear them calling, remember me. We do our best to find out as much as we can about each man and publish that information. We want to honor and remember each man.